Hi everyone and welcome to June Paint Along. And if you've been following our Paint Along series, you know that the, the Paint Along is done in four installments. Every Wednesday I'll release a new video. We're going to begin with the planning this week, then we'll do the underpainting, and then the third week we'll do the actual pastel layering, and then the fourth week will be for the resolution. And as I say in, in the past, if you don't want to wait in between, just wait till the end of the month and you can watch all four videos together and then that way you don't want to. But it's by design that I'm slowing down the process because a lot of times we're very impulsive when we paint. We just want to get in there and paint with passion and, and move on to the next one. And I think you'll discover by slowing down, at least for one painting each month, you will really uh, end up with a much more thoughtful uh, and better results. So let's get started with today's painting and this is the planning stage so I'm going to show you a few things um, I like to say make a plan then we can plan to let go so some plans I do quickly like on a dry erase board and some plans I take a little bit more time this pl this particular scene I have to slow down because it is complicated now if you can see the photo of our scene it's a, a lovely little mountain stream with rocks and I know many of you have been asking for moving water, white water, and rocks. And so here it is in all its glory. And when I look at it, the first thing that I say to myself is, I'm a little bit overwhelmed. Where do I begin? You know, what, how do I simplify this? And you know, in the past we've talked about editing the clutter and trying to decide what's important in a painting, what should we leave in and what should we take out. So editing the clutter is going to be really important for this particular scene. Because if we start by trying to paint the painting by putting in all the little details, like all these little rocks and little bits of water and the light on the leaves, then there's sticks and there's more leaves and it's just overwhelming. So we have to simplify it into just a few big simple shapes. And it's going to seem kind of strange, I think. Um, the way I'm going to start this painting, but I think in the end you'll be happy because we have eliminated a lot of the clutter and we've simplified it enough that it's doable. You know, we're going to make it approachable. So, as always, I'm going to start by doing a quick thumbnail. And I like to do my thumbnails on index cards so that I can use them to start the painting. And if you need a um, refresher on doing thumbnails, that you can uh, search for that over on the home page on, under posts. And then you can search for value studies or, um, yeah, I think it's under thumbnails or value studies. <clears throat> and I'll try to remember to put a link um, in the description. So the first thing I do is I look at this scene and I say to myself, how can I simplify this into just a few big shapes when there's so many shapes? There's all of these rocks and all these leaves and, and oh, it's just too many shapes. So what I have to do is m decide, well, what shapes are dark and what shapes are light and what shapes are somewhere in between or middle value. Now the best way that you can do this is to squint. So if you take this photo and maybe you can zoom in on the photo for just a second. Take the photo and I want you to squint your eyes and then squint down so that all of the dark shapes kind of merge together and then you don't really see the highlights on the rocks or anything like that. And if you squint down, do you see that really all of these rocks over here and all this whole area on the left hand side plus right over in here are all dark. They become one big dark shape. And then this area here is light you see the light on the leaves and then there's some light in the water and everything else just becomes a middle value. So basically you have three values in this scene, a dark shape and we can connect all these darks, a lot, some light shapes and then everything else becomes a middle value. Now if you want to test yourself, if you don't trust the squinting, and the squinting is really the easiest way to do it, and you always have your eyes handy so it's not like you need another tool, but if you like tools, a good one to use is a piece of red cellophane. And you can get um, sewing glasses that are red um, for sew, for, to help you choose fabrics. Um, so that's a fun little tool you can use. I've got red cellophane on Amazon. I don't, they sell it for some reason. But watch what happens when I put the red cellophane over that. It's kind of just like I'm squinting. Let me see it. So 
Again, all the dark areas become one big dark shape. And then this all becomes kind of a light shape. And then the water actually becomes a middle value shape. So this actually shows it a little bit differently than when I squinted, but I was really close enough just by squinting. But a piece of red cellophane is a handy tool because it takes away all of the detail and allows you to just see the big shapes. Now if I really look cl closely and I start to be analytical, I see there's a little light shape here, there's a light shape here, there's light. That's getting too picky because we can put the highlights on the rocks once the painting starts getting developed. But if we start the painting with all the little highlights, then we get too busy too quickly in the painting. So we want to keep things big and simple for as long as we can. So then what I did was I took my pencil and then simply looked at those big shapes and drew, and drew them in so that they were nice, big, and simple. So I know that all of this over here is dark. I'm going to include this one dark rock in the foreground and then all of these rocks were dark and I'm going to connect them. Whenever you can connect your dark shapes or your light shapes, it always is a good thing because it allows you to have a stronger foundation. So all that is going to be dark and then we have where the stream kind of comes in the back and then all of this is going to be middle and then the light is going to be right in here and then there's some light on that log and there's some light in the water. This is the water down here. Alright, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use some grayscale markers. Now I like to use grayscale markers because it creates a nice solid value map. So in other words, sometimes when we do our little value studies, a lot of times this is what I see people like to do. Um, this is dark, so they go like this. That's dark, that's dark, and that's hard to read. Do you know what I'm saying? That is harder to read. Instead of doing that, what we want to do is have nice, big, solid shapes of value. So I know that these are all the dark shapes. I'm just going to outline them so I remember. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill them in with a nice, solid, even coating of a dark value marker. And I will put a link or I'll put a description in the description what markers I like to use. But really, any grayscale markers, you want three values. A dark, this is the dark, a middle, and a light value. So then I'm going to take the lightest and put that in the, um, the lighter shapes. In here, and in here, and in here. And actually this scene really lends itself to just three values, which actually simplifies things for us. So we have a dark shape, a middle value shape, and then the light shapes I just leave alone. So this is basically the same thing that I already did. Um, but what this does is it's going to give me a nice strong value map. And I'm going to actually, next week, when we start with the underpainting, I'm going to actually start by blocking in the painting, not looking at this because there's too many decorations and details there, but I'm going to block it in like this. This is a foundation and I'm going to gradually add the, the details and the highlights and all the accents and all that good fun stuff. But we're going to start nice and big and simple. Now, if you choose to use this photo, you can use the same thumbnail or if you want to redesign it in any way you want, feel free to do that. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is, just to give you a heads up for next week, <clears throat> is how am I going to start the painting? I'm actually going to do the painting next week on a piece of burgundy Canson Miton paper, which is this, the um, unsanded paper that everyone loves to hate. I actually like Canson paper because it teaches me to have a light touch. So if you tend to be very heavy handed, Canson might not be your friend, but it will teach you to have a lighter touch. Now Canson has the bumpy side and it also has a smooth side. So I'm going to be working on the smooth side. Now what if you don't have Canson paper or you really dislike it so much that you don't want to even give it a try? What you can do is you can tone your own sanded paper. I want to show you how you can quickly do that. I have a couple of burgundy, reddish hard pastels. I'm going to put it down on my sanded paper and I'm going to take a piece of pipe insulation or really any blending tool will work. You can even use paper towel. And look 
how easily I could tone my paper so that I will be working on a burgundy sanded surface rather than the canson. But I actually want to paint on the canson just to show you guys that yes, we can be successful with canson paper and it's a lot less expensive than sanded paper. So it's a good thing to, to learn how to do. So the next part of our planning stage is to choose the pastels for the painting. So what I'm going to do is head on over to my pastel box and I'll meet you over there and we will choose some pastels. All right, everybody, I am back. I'm over here in my messy corner. This is actually where I paint um, most of the time. And this is my box, um, one of the boxes that I have. And so I'm gonna work out of this box. It's got enough in there that I think will uh, allow me to pick a good, cohesive, harmonious palette. And that's, after all, the goal of picking the pastels in advance. Really, the reason why I pick them in advance is so that I'm not overwhelmed by all of this and all of these drawers full of pastels. It, they're just everywhere. All the shelves that you see behind me, there's pastels everywhere. So I want to keep a, a simple limited palette. The way I do it is I look at my photo and I say to myself, I need to find pastels that are a good range of value and color and intensity that will cover all the elements in this scene. So I usually start with the dark. So I say to myself, what do I need for the darks? And there's some dark in the trees, but there's also a lot of darks in the rocks. Now, my logical brain will tell me, well, Karen, those rocks are kind of gray. They're kind of brownish gray, and the trees are green. That's the local color that I see. But if I just paint something with the local color, it's not going to be very interesting or exciting. So I want to have some colors that are more beautiful, more colorful than just simply brown or gray. But they also have to work. So I'm going to start by choosing a few dark values um, that I know that I can layer them together and they will form a more interesting dark. So I always like to start, and I have a little towel that as I choose them, I will wipe them down and then that way I can, sometimes I can't see what they are. Here's a nice dark burgundy. Now remember, we are gonna be working on burgundy paper. So I, if I put burgundy pastel on burgundy paper, it's not gonna show up very well, but I'll use it anyways. I'll pick a nice dark purple. I would really like to have a nice, dark, rich blue, and I'm not seeing the one that I want in this particular set. This happens to be a harder pastel, but it will still work, so I'm going to throw that one in there. Um, hmm. How about a nice, dark green, because there are a lot, of, there is a lot of green in those rocks, so I have a nice, dark warm green and you see that nice dark warm green and I'll take a picture of the um, of this tray so that you can get study them up close because I'm going a little bit quickly in this video but you'll be able to study them close up here's a nice dark cool blue so this is more of a blue green I was about to say I actually need another one of these because look how tiny this has gotten I'm going to throw in a dark brown just for the sake of putting in some dark brown, which is the local color on some of those rocks. And what else could I use for the rocks? Um, just how about a nice dark reddish brown? I'll put that up there. And then finally, I have the wonderful Terry Ludwig eggplant pastel, which is number... Uh, is. Uh, now I can't think of the number of it. I'll, I'll have to find it for you. And I think that's it. And sometimes you need to have a piece of paper to test it. This is a nice, rich, deep dark, and I will use it only in the accent areas. In other words, I'm not going to block in all the darks with that. It's just too dark. And then I'll have nowhere to go with my darks. It won't be as interesting if I make it too dark too soon. So those are the darks. The next thing I'm going to do is say to myself, well, what other colors will I use to build up those rocks? So I need, uh, a really easy way to do this is if you just simply choose middle values of those same colors. So I'll choose a middle value of the purple and a middle value of that reddish burgundy. Let's just swap these. 
and a middle value of that blue. And you notice how quickly I'm choosing these. I'm not agonizing over them to make sure that's exactly perfect because that's the beauty of pastel, that we can just, you know, have fun layering colors and there's really no right or wrong way to do it. Um, the brown, let's find a middle value of that brown. That's going to be over here. And then some middle values of those greens that I have. So let's look over in my green section and let's get a middle warm green and let's find a middle cool green. And again, I'm going to have a picture of this so that you can see up close how I came to these decisions. Alright, so now I'm starting to build my rocks and I'm going to have to add some highlights on the rocks and some color in the water and color on the foliage. So let's then concentrate now on the foliage. So let's look and we see that there's some light greens like where the sunlight is hitting the, the foliage and then we have some cooler greens in the shadowed areas. So I'm going to start by choosing some cooler greens for those shadows, so some blue greens. Okay. Oh. Then let's get some. Oh, this is a nice green. Just going to have a variety of greens in the cooler, distant areas. I'm going to have some lighter, cooler, bluer, duller. How about a nice blue green? We can use that in there somewhere. Oops, I covered it up. And then where the sunlight starts to hit the foliage, I have what we would consider a true grassy green. I like to call that the grassy green. That one's a little bit darker. I'll put that one in there. And then where the sunlight hits the foliage, I'm actually going to use a warmer green, not a lighter green. So not a paler green, but a green that has more yellow in it. So a, a yellow green. And we'll talk more about this as we the painting develops, but if you want to create the illusion of warm sunlight on an object, we don't want to go lighter or paler. We want to actually go a little bit more intense. And I'm putting down some really bright, intense, I call these spicy greens, because these are going to be those little sprinkles on our cupcake that we'll put in at the end. Now I think I could use a few more greens in there because this is a this dark forest and there's an awful lot of green going on. So the more I have, the better it will be. But I don't want to fill up my tray. So if I start to notice that my tray is overflowing, I have to stop. That means I probably have too many colors going on for this one particular painting. So then we're good. we're good with the greens. Now let's talk about the water. Now the water is reflecting all of the green, browns, and grays in the rocks. We're not getting very much reflection of the blue sky, but we are getting a little bit. So that means for the water I can actually use some of the same greens, but I do need to have a little bit of blue for the um, reflection of the sky that's happening. So I'm going to put and notice there's no sky showing at all in uh, this scene. This is kind of an intimate, we're up close and personal with these, um, with the rocks and the water. Where we have the foam on the water, our logical brain, thinking brain says, oh, foam on the water, well that's going to be white. We should just put some white. But if we put pure white, it's going to look um, chalky. What, think of chalkboard chalk. So I never use pure white, very rarely. I should never say never, but very rarely. So where the foam is in the shadow, I'm actually going to use a light value blue. So let's go and get a light value, a couple of light value blues for the sea, for the um, water, white water in the shadows, but where it emerges into the sunlight, it gets warmer, so we're going to actually make it more of a pale yellow. So I'm going to put a pale yellow. That one's filthy, needs to be cleaned a little bit better. And I'm going to make get a little bit lighter, but yet still not white. Let's get a little bit lighter, and almost white, but it's still pale yellow. And I don't, let's see if I actually have a white one in here. 
Oh, I'm just making it more dirty. Time for another towel. Hmm. Sometimes they get so dirty that nothing's gonna help it but a piece of sandpaper. So this guy here, this towel is not gonna help. It really needs a piece of sandpaper. Michael, will you grab me a piece of uh, any kind of sanded paper over there on the scrap pile over there on the table? On the table. Over there on the table, there's scrap paper. I, I want to show you guys this because it's a great little trick. Um, so I've got the white water, and now we need highlights on the rocks, and I am going to come in and take lighter values of, remember I started with the dark, and then I added middle, now I want to add even lighter values of those same colors, and those will be the highlights. There's a basket on top of that thing of paper. No, no, there's another basket. This was not a good idea. There's another basket on top. Oh my no, he's picked up every single box. There you go, bingo, you got it. Thank you. <laughs> I have lots of scrap paper. I want to get a sanded piece. All right, watch this. Trust me, this was worth it. I'm going to take, look how dirty this is. I cannot get it clean, so I have to sand off the really stubborn dirt. Now I might have tried the cornmeal, but sometimes it's just easier to sand it. So now I'm going to actually use that. So back to selecting the pastels. Something, well, some little bird said, Karen, don't you see turquoise in that white water? And I, I believe I do see turquoise. So I'm going to throw a little turquoise for the white water. Perfect. And then highlights for the rocks. We have the same greens that we can use. Uh, and I added some purples. I, I, you know what I see like a, um, where this, mo kind of this mossy stuff, lichens, kind of this color. So I'm going to throw that in there for the rocks. And I believe this is going to be a good palette for this painting. Now it may be that I actually will add some, and it may be that I won't use every single color that I picked out, but at least it's a good start. And it's going to really help me not be overwhelmed by too many colors. And so what your job to do this week is to do your thumbnail, be good and do your thumbnail, and select your palette in advance. And then stay tuned for next week when we're going to start the painting on, remember, burgundy, canson, or you can tone your own paper if you want to use sanded paper. And so I hope you enjoy this part of our paint along, and let's paint. Welcome everybody, this is week two of our paint along for the month of June. So last week we started the painting by um, doing a value thumbnail and then we selected the pastel palette that we were going to use. We came up with our story. So we basically did our planning. This whole idea of making a plan then planning to let go is so important. So. Last week was time for the plan. This week we're going to start by blocking in the painting. So we're going to set up the painting. Now, so far in these paint along video series, I've tried to do a different type of underpainting or start every time. So we get a, we can experiment with a variety of ways to start a pastel painting. So this week what I want to do is return back to my roots, meaning how did I learn how to first paint? You know, when you first start with pastels and it's all strange, like, what do I even do? How do I get them to make those marks that you see everyone make? How do I start? Where do I begin? Like, how do I even know where to begin? So the way I learned was, was a very, very simple, but yet yeah, effective way. I call it a no fail start. And I learned uh, to start on cans on paper. And usually my teacher, who was Marcia Savage, would start, she did a lot of landscape, so a lot of green here in North Georgia. And like she was very well, is very well known for her, her trees and her rocks and water. And oftentimes she would paint on burgundy color cans on paper. Now she doesn't do that anymore because we all grow, we all evolve as artists. But I thought, you know what, let's, 
let's revisit back to where I began. So, which is why last week I showed you that I was going to work on, this is Canson unsanded paper, not the Canson touch, which is sanded. And I'm using the smooth side, not the bumpy side. So, which is actually, this is considered the wrong side, the smooth side. The correct side is the bumpy side. But now I had some of you write to me and say, well, I don't have burgundy cans on paper. What can I use? So I showed you all last week how we could actually simply tone our own paper by using burgundy color pastels and just rubbing it in on any kind of paper. Even if you have a light color cans on, you can make it burgundy very, very simply. Why, you might ask, am I going to be working on burgundy? Why can't, can I use blue? Can I use yellow? Can I, well, you know, the answer to that is you can use any color you want, but I'm selecting burgundy for this particular painting because I happen to know that burgundy is going to work well as a tone under, uh, under painting to color with all of the green and uh, purples and violets that I see in our reference photo, which remember is the rocks and the water, the stream with a little bit of white water. I know that if I start with the burgundy undertone, not only is it dark, so it makes it rich, but the reddish color, the burgundy color works really well to make the greens more interesting and more vibrant. So I selected the burgundy on purpose. So you are welcome to use any color that you want, but just know that it's it would be really interesting if you tried burgundy so that you f can see for yourself how it affects the colors we're going to put on top. So what we're going to do for today's video is just simply start the painting by blocking it in. And in the past we've done wet underpaintings, we've done alcohol wash, um, I think we did a dry underpainting. We're going to do another dry underpainting today because we can't really get cans on wet. <clears throat> Although I have heard people use alcohol very, very lightly and had success, but I tend to use it for dry underpaintings. And we're going to block in the extremes, meaning I'm going to block in the dark areas, the light areas, and the most intensely colored areas. And that's going to be the initial base or foundation for the painting. Then I will build upon those big simple shapes or blocks of color in next week's video where we'll then start to refine those shapes and make them more interesting and make them more recognizable. So we have a very, very busy reference photo and it's almost um, a little bit daunting to think that we're going to be able to simplify this. So if you remember from last week's video, I did the value thumbnail and I decided that when I squinted, all of the rocks and shadow area kind of became one big dark blob and I connected them so that they weren't disjointed or spotty. Then I had the middle value areas of the, of the sunlit side and then some of the white water and this very, very light area in the back became the lightest value. So I'm going to translate this thumbnail onto my paper and I'm going to be using hard pastels to block in those big simple shapes. The dark shapes, the light shapes, and the uh, middle value shapes and the most intense color. So it'll make more sense when I start. Um, oh, and well I should show you this first. I went ahead and I selected some hard pastels to do this initial block in. I picked about four. I'm going to hold them up here. Well, right down here. Can you see them? Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is a dark blue. This is a kind of a middle value um, turquoise. I, I, this is a bright yellow green. This is just a middle value green. And this is another turquoise. Now, this is the darkest one. And you might be thinking, well, your light isn't very light. I don't want to go with the very, very lightest light or the very, very darkest dark because those will be saved for kind of the highlights and the accents. So this is kind of in the middle range. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to draw in my big simple shapes first and I'm going to use, I'm actually going to use a pastel pencil. Now a lot of times when I do my initial drawing I'll just use a regular pencil, but because I'm working on this burgundy dark paper, a regular pencil wouldn't show up very well. And I want to just share this with you. I'm going to actually uh, blog about this or post about this. I just discovered this uh, sharpener. 
by Faber Castell, and I'll put a picture of it in the comments. And it's got a color side, and I suppose this is for fat uh, charcoal or pencils and for skinny ones. And it gave such a wonderful, nice point to this pastel pencil. So I'm really pleased with this. Because I know it's really hard for us to find good sharpeners that don't uh, break the lead of a pastel pencil. I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk more about that. I'm excited about that. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to just put in the big, simple shapes. I'm not <clears throat> looking at the photograph, but instead I'm looking at my little thumbnail. Which means that ultimately my, my uh, painting might not match my photograph, but the important thing is that I'm going to block it in with big, sim <clears throat> excuse me, big simple shapes of dark, light, and middle value. And I'm going to just copy my little reference photo as best as I can. I'll probably have to make some adjustments. So this is the dark shape. I'm using very light touch with the pastel pencil. I'm using a lighter color so that I can see it on the paper. So the next thing I'm going to do is block in the dark shapes. And I'm going to use a dark blue hard pastel. And I'm going to just scrub it in where I see all the, where the dark areas are. Now this whole idea of blocking in with these big simple shapes is what we're trying to do is create a strong foundation or, or, or a strong abstract design in our underpainting. Yes, we want to paint those rocks. Yes, we, we eventually will paint the leaves on the tree. Um, but we have to lay the foundation before we can put in those details. Those details have to come last. And then sometimes it's really hard to, to um, hold back, you know? We want to put in the fun stuff too soon. But if we block it in and we keep things big and simple for as long as we can, then we have a stronger foundation to build the painting upon. So there's the dark areas. The next thing I'm going to do would be the lightest areas, which are actually um, the white water. So I'm looking at my thumbnail and I see that I have light there, light right underneath this dark area of rocks. And then this whole area in here is a light shape. And then the sky. Well, it's not really the sky. It's actually the, the trees that have a lot of sunlight on them. So those are the light areas. Then I'm going to block in the most intensely colored areas, which are going to be the sunlit green. Oops, I wanted to use this bright yellow green. So where the sun is hitting the green, this is actually a middle value in here. I'm going to put this middle value green in here so I don't get confused. But the sunlit side is all the foliage on the right. And then maybe a little bit in the water down in here. And a little bit over here. So then we say, okay, well, what is left? Well, what is left is some more of this foliage, basically. And it's not quite as brilliantly sunlit as this yellow green. So I'm going to go a little bit duller with my yellow green for this part of the foliage. And then we have a little bit of water left in here. So I'm going to go ahead with that darker turquoise just to put in some of that area that's supposed to be water right in here. And I think I'm also going to take it and put just a little bit on top of this dark blue. And the reason why I'm doing it is because I know it's in the shadow and I kind of want it to feel cooler. So I'm just giving another light layer. Now, this looks kind of interesting in that you're probably thinking, well, what's going on here? It doesn't look anything like the photo. But if you stop looking at the thumbnail and then look at the photo, you can start to see, oh, this is the dark shadowed area. This is the water as it comes through. This is the sunlit side and a little bit more sun over in here. So as an abstract design, you want to say, do I have an interesting arrangement of shapes? Are there different sizes? Are they different um, 
there are they irregular meaning there's not nothing like repeating exactly the same um, and if not that's when you want to make changes so when I look at this I say you know I can see some interesting shapes and arrangements and you know would it work as an abstract well maybe you know I don't do abstracts but that's the main thing you want to say is it isn't an interesting design now this is a paint along so at this point would be a really good time for you if you're painting along with me to pause the video and go back and block in your big simple shapes and remember we're going to start with the dark we're going to add, go to the light then the most intense color and then you'll pick a color for the other areas and when you come back we are going to do one more thing all right so you pause the video now we're back and I'm almost done with this stage you can see the burgundy color peeking through and that's really great because that's going to help give interest to all of the greens and all of the rock colors but sometimes I like to blend in this first layer just so that I can have a more kind of mysterious out of focus underpainting and, and I usually use a piece of pipe insulation foam this time I'm going to use paper toweling and this is Viva paper towels and if you we get this in the United States no Viva Michael's laughing at me but Viva is good because you know what it doesn't um, um, crumble. crumble and it doesn't make those little paper towel crumbs so I'm going to just go ahead and rub in this very first layer with the paper towel you will still see the uh, burgundy underpainting but what is happening is uh, I am then going to be left with a more out of focus, dreamy kind of underpainting. I'm just going to switch it to get it clean. Which then I'll have um, nice big interesting shapes of color to respond to next week when we start refining these shapes and start adding the detail. And I, and this step I like because I like to throw everything out of focus because then I can really start to feel what's happening with my shapes and this is really for me the only way that I can approach something as overwhelming as this photo with all of these little bits and pieces if I can start big and simple I will then start to refine it as we go forward next week so your job this week is to get a piece of burgundy orange or red or some kind of um, warm tone dark paper and start to block in your big simple shapes and if you have not yet selected your palette I'll show it one more time and I'll put another picture in the comments but you want to start to pick out your palette um, so that you'll be ready to paint next week so again oh I wanted to say this because some of you have told me that you like to wait till the end of the series there's four videos in the series this is number two you can scroll down to get to number one if you're tuning in now and you didn't see number one just keep scrolling and you'll get to it but if you want to wait wait till the end of the month and then you can watch all four videos at once and I look forward to seeing what we what we do with this and let's have fun painting Time to start. She wants. She's gonna watch today. I think. There's Heidi. Let's see if Heidi will will be on her good behavior. All right. We are live. Okay. Hello, everyone. <laughs> We're not really live. Hello. This is part three of our June paint along. And so, if you've been with us so far, we have already done our plan for our painting. And last week we did our block in for our painting and we created a somewhat abstract collection of big shapes. Uh, it doesn't look much like anything but hopefully today we're going to start to add pastel and we're going to start to refine those big simple shapes and get them smaller and smaller and more detailed so they'll start to actually look like rocks and water and trees. But I'm going to give you one big tip for today's paint along and that is 
to remove the labels from what it is you are painting. In other words, don't call them rocks or trees or water. Instead, describe them by using art words. This is a dark shape with a soft edge. This is a green, cool shape that has some gestural marks. In other words, I'm not saying tree, I'm not saying rock, but what I am saying is describing it in art words. And what that does is it short circuits your thinking brain that wants to jump in and give you the symbol. So in other words, the minute you say, I'm painting this rock, your brain will jump in and say, oh, rock, let me help you with that. And before you know it, you've got a potato. When we talk, we don't want potatoes. We have to observe things and describe them with art words. And so that's, what, that's my advice to you today. Remove the labels. Now, probably when I paint today, I will be giving you the label because I want you to see what I is I'm painting. But it, a good habit to get into is to just uh, remove labels and describe things visually. The other thing I want to talk about before I start painting is the actual paper that I'm working on. I am working on Canson uh, unsanded paper, the smooth side. And, and some, one of you ask, why are you using the smooth side versus the rough side of the paper? and the, the, the bumpy side. Now the bumpy side is supposedly the correct side and the idea is that you can get more uh, layers because of the it's a toothier. I don't really find that to be true and what happens is I don't really like the texture of the bumpy side because it's a little bit too mechanical or regular looking. I love texture in my paper but I want to create my own texture. I want it to be random and so that is why I like to have the smooth side uh, because it's you don't have to fight that texture. Now, a lot of artists who I know who really enjoy working on Canson work on the smooth side. So give it a try, do both, and see the difference for yourself. Because you may prefer one side over the other. All right, so I'm going to get ready uh, over here to add the soft pastel. And the one thing that I'm always going to do is begin by reinforcing the dark areas. And I look over here and I'm like, this is just an odd collection of shapes, so I have to start refining those shapes. So I'm going to start to add, uh, refine it by reinforcing those dark areas. And let me pull up a dark pastel. Here's a dark purple. So this painting is about those rock shapes. Now remember, I'm not going to call, don't call them rocks. <laughs> I'm going to call them rocks. Because if I don't call them rocks, you're not going to know what I'm looking at. But when you paint, why don't you just say to yourself, oh, there's a collection of dark shadowed areas. I'm just going to, wherever I see those dark shapes, I'm going to put them in. There's dark in here. And I'm starting to get a little bit more um, refined with the shapes that I'm making. Whereas before, it was just like I squinted and it was all the dark area. I think I'm not going to put the log going across the, um, the water. You can choose to put it in if you want. But I think I'm going to not put it in. It is probably an element that I can add if I choose to. There's, let's see, I've got this coming up here. Then there's the shadowed area over here kind of sneaking up into the trees. And there's a couple of tree trunks. I'm going to go ahead and put those in now because those are dark shapes. And I'll cover them up, but it's nice to start by putting them in. All right, so I have one layer of dark. Now I'm going to go over that one layer of dark with another dark value pastel. This, that was a dark purple. This is a dark burgundy. And the reason why I'm using two Oops, that one just broke. Two pastels is because I would really like to have a, a little bit more interest in my darks. So I'm lightly layering those dark areas, trying to refine the shapes that are in those rocks. So I'm using the side of the pastel and I'm trying to describe the rocks in big, simple marks, flat marks, so that they feel angular and strong. Let's go ahead and add another dark value. This is a dark blue. Now I'm finding 
as I just pressed that that's not going on as well. And what I realized is I picked up a harder pastel. And one thing about working on the cans on paper is it is definitely harder to put hard pastels versus the softer pastels. It doesn't take it as easily. So you're going to have more success on the on sanded paper if you use the softer pastels. So most of the pastels I have here in my tray are Terry Ludwig pastels. And that actually is working better. Alright, that was a dark brown. Now I'm going to add, I think, you know, here, this is, sometimes they get so dirty, that's why I wear a towel over my shoulder so I can wipe them clean. And I realize that that is a nice, super dark Terry Ludwig and I'm going to just put it right at the base of those rocks just to ground them. I don't want to put it everywhere because then it's just everything is going to be just too dark. So just at the base of those rocks in the foreground. I'm also not putting it in the distance because those rocks are further back in the picture. So I want them to have a little bit of that aerial perspective so they look like they go back in space. So we're starting to get a feeling of some of the rocks. And Heidi, I think, you know, I've talked to some of you about it. I think she thinks that I'm talking to her, but yet not doing anything about it. So she's wondering, why are you talking and you're not looking at me? It's confusing. I'm trying to get into her mind a little bit. So now I'm reinforcing the foliage in the trees, and I'm using a dark green. And I'm trying to make my marks go side to side. Oh, I forgot to say, this is a paint along, and I'm just painting along my merry way, not realizing you might be trying to follow along. What I'm going to suggest you do is pause the video when you, when you want to get caught up. So there's no way that anyone's going to paint along with me, trying to listen to what I say and then painting at the same time. So what you'll have to do is listen, pause, work, and come back and catch me. So what I have done so far is put in all the darks and I'm still putting in the darks of the tree. So if you haven't paused the video, this is probably a very good time to do that so that you can get caught up. But I'm still reinforcing all the dark areas, but you can start to see that some of these shapes are starting to become a little bit more refined. It's starting to look a little bit like something. Not a whole lot yet, but a little bit. And let's see, I have, I think I'm good on my darks. I think what I'm going to do is now move on and put in, I think what I want to do is establish some of the light on the trees. Now, I have my sun button here. That's <coughs> Excuse me, telling me that the sun is coming in from the left and illuminating the right hand side of the scene. <coughs> so what I'm going to do is take a slightly lighter, warmer green pastel and just kind of make some <coughs> excuse me, some gestural marks to indicate some of the light. Some of the light is filtering in a little bit over on the right hand side as well because I have to break up that dark area but I have to also remind myself what is the focus what is this painting all about it's not really about the trees although the trees are there and they kind of set the scene but the tr but the main focus of this painting is the water so I'm not I don't want to spend a whole lot of time developing this in great detail. I want to leave a lot of it to the viewer's imagination. What I just did was I picked up a brighter warm yellow to fill in that really light spot where the sun is filtering through. There's no sky in this particular um, scene. So I'm just using the, the nice warm yellow green to indicate where the light is hitting the foliage and filtering in. Some, it filters down even into the foreground area. I can do a little bit, what is this one? The, the beauty of having my palette pre-selected, and I uh, always like to, to reinforce this when I paint, is 
that I can just keep going and not have to go back to my box to find the right color and value. If you don't do this, try it. Humor me, because I know people say, I don't want to do that. I just I, That's no big deal. I can just pick up my colors as I paint. Try it and see if it doesn't make a difference in how efficiently you can paint. Now, I want to show you something. I'm taking this green and I'm putting it down in the water because it's reflecting into the, the still area down here. There's a little pool of water. And so this bright yellow green is reflecting and so I'm just putting it in horizontal strokes so that the water lays flat. All right, so this is a good time to get caught up to pause the video and start to add the light to your foliage. So using warm yellow greens to incorporate the light. And I'm going to keep going and add a little bit of a cooler green to some of those shadowed areas of foliage. Again, you might think, well, you're spending an awful lot of time on the trees, on the background, but I'm, I really want to establish it so that I can focus on what's really important here, and of course that is the rocks and the water. And again, some of these trees will be refined further next week when we start to um, add the finishing touches. I'm going to do just enough to, get, to keep this going. All right, I think I've got enough of the foliage that I can now concentrate more fully on the rocks. So I've got the darks in place for the rocks. Now what I want to do is start to create other planes um, on the rocks, so where the light might be hitting some of them. So, and, and truly, I am not, and I will say this, I am not copying the exact placement of each rock. Uh, that would drive me crazy. And that and you could do that. You really could do that. And it would you could make this photorealistic and copy the rocks exactly they are in your photograph. But it's challenging to do that. And so what I would rather do is just create look at the rocks that are in the photo and then create some rocks shapes that work in this particular painting. So I have the dark side, I have a middle value side, and I'm using purples and dull, dull purples, really, mauves, to create the middle value section of some of these rock planes. And again, I'm not copying what I see because that would be, that would drive me crazy and I would end up, I could do it, but it would be and maybe more of a photorealistic rendering. But again, just stressing that I just want it to look like rocks and water, but in a painterly way. Now, some of these rocks actually have a little bit of blue. It's ref light reflecting from the sky, so I'm putting some blue on the on the upper portions of some of the rocks in here. Not on the sunlit rocks, but the rocks in the shadow area. So I'm putting a little blue on those. There's also some mossy stuff growing on some of those rocks. So I'm using a dull gray olivey green to create some of that feeling of moss and growth on those rocks. There's actually some, um, I, don't know if I, have, I don't know if I pulled that color. Maybe I did. There's some really cool orangey yellow kind of things growing on some of these rocks in the sunlight. So I'm going to use like a yellowy orange for that. Now I have to think about, okay, so I have my dark part of the rocks, my middle value part of the rocks. Now where are we going to put the light? In other words, where the light is hitting some of those rocks. And we can look, and we know the sun is coming from here, so that top part of the rock is getting some light on that side. Um, definitely some of the rocks over where you see the sunlit foliage there's also some light on the rocks. So I'm just hitting those rocks and, and I'm tapping them with my finger just to soften them a little bit, especially in the distance because that, those are further back so we wouldn't see the detail. But as we get closer to us we can actually 
create a, a warmer feeling of light. So I'm going to actually use a little bit more intense, that yellow that I just had out. I'm just going to enhance that a little bit. I, I looked over here and I pulled out a rust color. So I think I'm going to use the rust color on some of these foreground locks just to give them a little bit more interest. I also see that I pulled out a red violet and I'm going to add some red violet to some of these rocks as well just to give them a little bit of more variety and interest. Alright, so now I have my foliage, my rocks, and it's time to put in the water. Alright, now the, what I'm doing is I'm simplifying those that big simple shape and I'm starting to add more and more smaller marks to refine the shapes. Next week is when we will really come in and uh, add the f finishing touches. This is a good time for you guys, if you're following along, if you're painting along, to stop and go ahead and refine your rock shapes. You need the dark side, you need the shadowed side, you need flat areas of color, they're not just brown or gray, and then you need to get hit it with some sunlight. Now, we're going to go in and put some of the water. Now, one thing that I notice about the water is that, for the most part, it's kind of a greenish blue so it's it's green why because it's reflecting the uh, lot the foliage it's blue in some areas because it's reflecting some of the sky that's filtering through that we don't actually see so I'm going to start by putting in some green and I already put a little bit of green and one thing that is really important is that you um, Use horizontal strokes, even though the water is going down over rocks. Be because it's laying flat and it's pooling up around the rocks, those areas have to be laid in with flat horizontal marks. So there's the green. Now I'm going to go back, and in the shadowed areas, the blue is much, um, a little bit, a little bit darker, but then in the distance, we have a little bit of has to be a little bit lighter because it's in the distance. So I'm using a middle value blue to compensate for that. I'm putting in all the flat parts of the water first. Actually, I'm going to make it a little bit darker. The flat parts of the water. And then I will come in and start to have the water that spills over the rocks. All right, now I have all the flat part of the water. We're going to now start to spill the water over the rocks. Now, this you have to be careful because if you try to copy what you have in your photo and you've changed your rocks, do you know what I'm saying? It's not going to make sense anymore. So you have to take your rocks that you created and spill the water over your own rocks. Now, that I am making marks now. There's some water that's kind of collected underneath this rock. This rock has to get a little bit dark and underneath because it doesn't want to sit right. Okay. I'm using a, a light blue for these areas. Water kind of got stuck in between these rocks and then there's, it's starting to come over the top. So like little mini waterfalls. I'm going to use a darker blue because it's in the shadow area. And they're spilling over these rocks over in the corner. And then it's just kind of pooling up down over here. And it's much darker. Darker blue-green in this area. Then the last thing that we're going to do in this stage, I'm just adding a touch more of the blue. It seems to me like I probably needed a few more rocks in here, and I'm going to go ahead and put them in right now. Now, I'm sharing this with you because when you're trying to be painterly and not exactly copy, copy your photo, a lot of times what ends up happening is you don't end up with something that is believable. And so I had this big empty area of water because I had decided not to put the log. So I actually have to compensate and put a few more rocks. I talk about a lot when I teach my workshops that we have artistic, we have an artistic license and that we have to just not be afraid to take it out sometimes and try to make our own 
our own reality, but that reality still has to make sense. All right. So what I'm going to do right now is let's evaluate where we're at. We've taken those big simple shapes. We blocked in all the dark areas again, reinforced the dark areas, and we're starting to slowly refine the shapes so that they start to make sense and read like rocks and trees and water. Then we came in and we added color to our rocks. These rocks are still not refined enough. I have to actually go in and look at them and say, okay, which rocks are most important? Which rocks are less important? Where do I want to put the clarity? Because I don't want every single rock to have the same level of detail. So I have to decide where I'm going to refine it even further. Then we came in and we added the water, the flat water first, and then started to make those little mini waterfalls trickling over the rocks. We use cooler colors in the shadowed areas. And the next thing we're going to do is add warmer colors where the sun is hitting the light. And I'm not going to use white. What I'm going to use instead is a pale yellow, almost white. When you put it here, you can see that that's white. It's a very, very pale yellow. And that will help give that illusion of sunlight on the water. So there's water kind of spilling down over here but has sunlight on it. And you see how <clears throat> illuminated that looks compared to what it was before. There's a little bit more light over in here. All the light is mostly on the right hand side, right over here as well. Now I'm starting to get a little too nitpicky and that is what we do next week, right? Next week is where we do the final nitpicky details after we have evaluated. I've got enough information on this painting right now that if I kept going, chances are I would overwork the painting. I have to take time to step away from it, evaluate it, and decide where I'm going to put the clarity and the focus and the detail. So always stop sooner than later, which is why, sorry, which is why I recommend that you paint slowly and do this paint alongs in four parts so that you can have that week in between, leave it on your easel, come back around to it and say, ah, oh, that's working, or oh gosh, this area is not working. Taking the time in between the paintings is really going to help you slow down and be more thoughtful about your paintings. So I'm going to leave you today with this is step three and we'll come back next week to resolve this painting and I hope you have fun with it. Let's paint. Hey everyone, Karen here. This is week four of our June paint along and we've been painting a waterfall. And I wanna just put a few finishing touches on my painting this week. And so what I want you to do today is take time to, I'm gonna give a little introduction, but then I want you to take time to pause the video and I want you to analyze your painting the way I'm going to analyze my painting. Because what you decide your painting needs is not gonna be the same thing that I decide my painting needs because our paintings are not going to be the exact same thing. So you're gonna to have to take time to analyze your own painting and figure out what you need to do and what you need to do might be different from what I'm going to do. All right, so I had my painting up on the easel all week long and I'm glad I didn't touch it as usual because <clears throat> I probably would have ruined it and put too much information in there if I had kept painting last week. So I'm glad I took a break from it because what I did was I put what I call, I'm going to take this down for just a second. This is the magic mat. It changes everything because it allows you to just isolate the painting and from the background and all the all the um, clutter around it so that we can just zero in on the painting. And when I would walk by, <coughs> excuse me, occasionally I would look at it and I'd, I'd kind of make some mental notes about what I liked and what I didn't like. And then I came back to it today, this morning, before the video, and I had a fresh perspective. And what I realized is I really like what's happening in my particular painting <clears throat> that a lot of it is suggested. <clears throat> I don't have a lot of detail everywhere. 
And I'm happy about that because that's something that I, I have as one of my personal goals. Now, we all have different goals for our art. Some of us want to be more realistic. Maybe some of us even want to be photorealistic. I'm trying to get a little bit more abstracted, and so I'm happy with the way this is coming. Now, if you could, Michael, zoom in on some of these areas, I want to just talk about this. When we get close to this area here and this area here, you can see that it is just merely a collection of marks, colors, and values, like a dark mark, a middle value mark. If we come over here, we've got a dark mark and like one, two, three, there's probably four or five marks in this collection. Now, if we back away from the painting, so see if you can't zoom out, you see that these collection of random looking marks all of a sudden now look like rocks. They're suggestions of rocks. And that's what I'm trying to do with my paintings is to suggest detail rather than spell it all out. I want the viewer to participate in the paintings. So I really like what's happening in these areas that they're kind of left unfinished so I'm not going to touch those. So I really wanted to point that out to you because as a personal goal that's what I'm trying to do. So you figure out what you want to do. Obviously I could make a lot more detail in these rocks and they would be fine. But my choice is to leave them kind of um, suggested. I guess that's the best word. The next thing that I did this morning when I evaluated my painting is I asked myself again, what is my story? Why did I paint this? In other words, what's the point of this painting? I mean, what am I trying to say? What do I want you to see or feel? And for me, it was all about going towards the light. I loved the way the light filtered in through the, the trees and kind of lit up this quiet corner of the forest. And imagine that I was walking on a trail, you know, uh, alongside this little river and listening to the water trickle over the rocks, but going towards the light. That's the mood, that's the feeling, that's my story. And so that's what I want to concentrate on. So knowing that, I have to figure out what do I need to do to tell that story? What do I need to add or what do I need to take away? And here are the things that I decided I need to make adjustments with or to. I, I found that this pool here doesn't read well. It doesn't look like the water's contained in it. So I'm going to try to add another rock and maybe add some harder edges on these rocks and see if we can't keep that water in. Um, I want to brighten up the light because remember it's about the light and it's a little dull right now. And I want to play with the negative spaces with the tree trunks, which I've lost. So I need to reintroduce those tree trunks. I don't want to put, I'm not going to do probably anything to the water. I like the way it's coming here, except for this area in here. Everything else I'm going to leave alone. And then at the end, I'm going to come in and put a few spicy marks, some leaves, so I can have a little bit more of a three-dimensional feeling. So what I'm going to do is take my mat away, and I'm going to work on these areas that I talked about, and then I'll come back and vocally talk about what I did. Although I probably won't be able to keep my mouth shut, I'm always talking. What you can do right now is pause the video and analyze your own painting and figure out what adjustments you're going to make, if any, to your painting. And then, now that everyone is back, I'm going to go ahead and get started and I'm going to make the adjustments that are on my, well, I'll just put it right here. So I have to first work on this pool of water. How can I get this water to look like it's in this pool? I'm going to just add a few more rocks in here. Just using the colors that are here on my palette. That's the beauty of having that limited pre-selected palette. I think I need to enhance or make a harder edge on the rocks right in here. I think I'll add a little bit more of the light on the water down in here. I'm going to go ahead with a harder pastel and actually make a linear, ooh, I'm shouting with that, make a linear mark on these rocks right in here so that they stand out more. And then a little bit more blue 
on this little bit of water. All right, I think that helps. I think I actually need to darken the water a little bit behind the rocks. And notice what I'm doing now the, are, are what I call baby steps, tiny little adjustments. We don't want to go crazy with doing too many changes. I think that's better. Now I was wondering too if I thought that this piece of light coming over this little spill of water was a little bit too bright. So I'm going to take that pale blue and just kind of um, soften it just a little bit and let it just kind of trail around the rocks right in here. Let's get a little one right in here. And then where it hits the water, there's a little bit of spray, but not too much. Remember, it's not about down here. We want to look up a little bit. It's a little bit too stripy. And then I think I actually liked that it was a little bit brighter, so I'm going to actually go back and reintroduce that light. All right. What else did I want to work on? The distant um, trees and light. But I have to first put in some of the trunks, so I need to get a dark, let's go with a dark blue. No, let's go with a dark, this dark and reintroduce some of those trunks. Kind of just make some broken lines. And that will allow me to figure out where I'm going to put the negative spaces. What about on the left? We need to reintroduce some of those trunks that are lost over here as well. Okay, so now let's turn on the lights. Get a little bit lighter, a little bit brighter. This is a yellow green. I'm very lightly add, put it on top, let it filter down, and then start to put it in between some of these tree trunks because we want that idea that it's filtering in. Just make a few marks. Remember, put in a few marks and let the viewer fill in the rest. We don't have to spell everything out. It's all about suggestion. <clears throat> I have to make sure that my tree trunks are not perfectly lined up. So I'm going to break them up just a little bit. I think I need to have one kind of go at an angle. Because they're all straight like soldiers. And you know, we talk about that a lot. Our thinking brain is going to line things up and put things in order. And it's our job to break them up and throw them out of whack. We like it, it to be out of whack. Let's see if we can't brighten this up even more. And those of you who um, took on the challenge of using the Canson paper, I want to commend you. I've heard some good feedback that some of you are actually enjoying it and it's not as uh, aggravating as you thought it was, so congratulations on that. That makes me happy. Now I'm pushing a little bit harder, this is a soft pastel, because I want to give a feeling of some of the, the shapes of the leaves in here. So I'm pushing harder and making smaller little leaf type shapes. And then I think, I don't like that line right there, I'm going to soften it with my finger. And <clears throat> some of the cooler light coming in here. I'm going over to the to the right hand side now where it's the shadow side. I'm using a cooler green just to create some scribbles which are supposed to be leaf shapes. Again, I'm not painting single leaves. I'm just kind of hinting at the fact that there's some foliage over here in the shadows as well. Just some kind of gestural marks. Scribbles, really. Nothing more than scribbles. And did I use this guy? Yeah, I did. I put him right there. I want it to get even lighter, so I'm going to add a little bit of a yellow. I really need a pale yellow. Let's try this one. This is the lightest light <clears throat> that I'm going to use, and this is the last bit of light that I want to use. In the photo, if you're looking at the photo, you see that the light is almost white, and that's just a 
because the photo is uh, a little bit overexposed, we really don't want it to be quite that um, white. So I'm using a pale yellow. Let's sneak a little bit of light over here on the right hand side. And then I think we're going to finish up by pulling some darker leaves over the light. And this is simply to create a little bit more depth in the forest. So if I start to pull leaves on top of the light, then it starts to push that light area back a little bit more. And I'm going to use a brighter green to change it up and add a little bit more of those layers. And I think we'll put a few brighter ones on the left hand side as well. And the last thing that I'm going to do, put some over here, is I'm going to put the green spikes. So I'm going to put the brightest, most artificial greens that I happen to have in my box and I'm going to just simply say, okay, this is it's nice spicy greens. I want you to look at these. I'm pressing them as hard as I can and just making a few leaf marks. The, the reason why I'm doing this last is I, I don't want them everywhere because like spice in a dish, in a, in, if you're cooking, if, there, if it's too much spice all over the dish, you know, it gets to be too much. It's not delicious anymore. It loses its impact. Let's try to get a few bright yellow leaves. Remember, I saved this to the end. These are the spices. And again, I don't want to put them everywhere. If they're everywhere, then they lose the impact. So I'm just trying to think about how your eye moves through the painting and where they might see some of these nice little bright. Here's a nice. These are, these are artificial greens. I call these artificial greens. If you use these bright, intense greens all over in your forest, then it's going to look, well, it won't look very natural. But if you, on the other hand, save them for those final spice marks, then they have much more of interest and appeal. And I'm going to do a little bit more light on the left hand side. And then we have this area here. I think we could stand to have just a little bit of moss on the rock down here because some of these rocks are starting to catch some of the light. And we want to give a little bit more variety. I know it's dark over here, but we would see just a little bit more. One last thing. I'm going to take that super dark and I want to really ground these bottom rocks. Now, remember, I didn't really want to touch these, but I think I'm going to just add a little bit more of that darkest dark just to make sure that they are really setting down in the water. And I'll add a little bit of light. And the whole idea, let's, let's do this together. I want the viewer to come into the painting, follow the light as we go back through the forest and pick up on these nice interesting bits of color until we finally get all the way to the distance. So imagine walking alongside this little creek and getting to the light and that's the idea. And I'm going to stop right now because I, as I said I don't want to overdo this painting. I want it to feel kind of almost as an abstraction of a creek in the forest. You do as much detail as you want but I think what I really want you to get out of this demo is we must start with big simple shapes. This was very complicated, but when we started with big simple shapes, we then had the power to make as much detail as we want, as we're comfortable with. So I hope you've enjoyed this series of, of uh, the paint along series and I look forward to next month. So let's paint.